What we're going to do here for a minute is do a little sound test. Can you hear me? Can, can you hear me now? We're going to do a sound test here. And it goes, Phyllis is going to set the sound. Can you hear me? That's it. <laughs> okay. All right. We got a thumbs up on this. So we're going to start. We're going to take our hymnals and we're going to turn the inside cover, soul stirring, to the inside cover. In the middle of the, uh, the thing down at the bottom is a Bible verse. Everybody see that? Right here? Bible verse? We're on the white page. It's, it's not real hard. Okay. <laughs> what we're going to do is I'm going to say Ephesians 519. Then we're going to read out loud the verse and the uh, where it's located. All right. To start off. Okay. Is everybody ready? We're going to read that out loud after I say the verse. Ephesians 519. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in the heart of the Lord. Ephesians 5.19. Okay, starting off with the Bible verse. That's a good start. Let's say the song number 31. We'll sing all three verses.
Thank you very much. We have sound now. Glad to have Stella with us for the first time. I want to thank the mayor of Happydale for furnishing me something here. She had a family moved into Happydale from down south. And they were looking forward to seeing the snowfall. And I don't know how she did it, but she got a copy of the gentleman's diary. And I want to read some things out of that this morning. Thank you, Miss, uh, Mrs. Mayor, for uh, <laughs> digging this stuff up. December 8th, the first snow of the season, and the wife and I sat for hours by the window watching the huge, soft flakes drift down from heaven. It looked like a Grandma Moses print. So romantic, we felt like newlyweds again. I love snow. December 9th, we woke to a beautiful blanket of covered crystal white snow covering every inch of the landscape. What a fantastic sight. Moving here was the best idea I've ever had. Shoveled for the first time in years and felt like a boy again. This afternoon, the snowplow came along and covered up the sidewalks and closed in the driveway, and I got to shovel again. <laughs> what a perfect life. December 12th. The snow had melted all our lovely, the sun had melted all our lovely snow. Such a disappointment. My neighbor tells me not to worry, we'll definitely have a white Christmas. No snow on Christmas would be awful. Bob says we'll have to have so much snow by the end of winter that I'll never want to see snow again. I don't think that's possible. Bob is such a nice man. I'm glad he's our neighbor. December 14th, snow, lovely snow. Eight inches last night, the temperature dropped to minus 20. The snow, the cold makes everything sparkle so much. The wind took my breath away, but I warmed up by shoveling the driveway and sidewalks. This is the life. The snow plow came by this afternoon and buried everything again. I didn't realize I would have to do quite this much shoveling, but I'll certainly get back in shape this way. December 15th, 20 inches forecast. Sold my van and bought a four before. Bought snow tires for the wife's car and two extra shovels. Stocked the freezer. The wife wants a wood stove in in case the electricity goes out. I think that's silly. December 16th, ice storm this morning. Fell on my butt in the driveway, putting down salt. Hurt legs the devil. My wife laughed for an hour which I think was very cruel. <laughs> December 17th, still way below freezing. Electricity was off for five hours. I had to pile the blankets on to stay warm. Nothing to do but stare at the wife and try not to irritate her. Guess I should have bought a wood stove, but I'd hate to admit it to her. I hate it when she's right. December 20th, another 14 inches of the white stuff last night. More shoveling, took all day. Snow plow came by twice. Tried to find a neighbor kid to shovel, but they said they're too busy playing hockey. <laughs> I think they're lying. Called the hardware store to see about buying a snow blower, and they're out. I think they're lying. <laughs> Bob says I have to shovel or the city will have it, have it done and bill me. 
I think he's lying. <laughs> Bob was right about a white Christmas because 13 more inches fell today, December the 22nd. Took me 45 minutes to get all dressed up to go out. By then I had to go to the bathroom. And by the time I got undressed and then dressed back up, I was too tired to shovel. <laughs> Tried to hire Bob who has a plow on his truck, but he says he's too busy. I think he's lying. December 23rd, only two inches of snow today and warmed up to zero. The wife wanted me to decorate the front of the house. What is she, nuts? <laughs> Why didn't she tell me that a month ago? She says she did, but I think she's lying. I think she's lying. December 24th, six inches. Snow packed so hard by snow plow, I broke the shovel. Thought I was having a heart attack. If I ever catch the guy who drives that snow plow, I'll drag him through the snow by his hair. Tonight, my, the, the wife wanted me to sing Christmas carols with her and open presents, but I was too busy watching for the snowplow. <laughs> December 25th, Merry Christmas. 20 more inches of that blankety blank stuff. <laughs> the idea of shoveling makes my blood run cold. I hate snow. Then the snowplow driver came by asking for a donation and I hit him over the head with my shovel. <laughs> the wife says I have a bad attitude. I think she's an idiot. <laughs> December 26th, still snowed in. Why did I ever move here? It was all her idea. <laughs> December 27th, December temperature dropped to 30 below zero and the pipes froze. December 28th, warmed up to minus 20, still snowed in. December 29th, 10 more inches. Bob says I have to shovel the roof or it could cave in. How dumb does he think I am? December 30th, Roof caved in. <laughs> the snowplow driver is suing me for a million dollars for the bump on his head. <laughs> the wife went home to her mother. Another nine inches predicted. December 31st, set fire to what's left of the house. <laughs> no more, <laughs> no more shoveling. January 8th, it's, I feel so good. I just love those little white pills they keep giving me. Why am I tied to the bed? <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Mayor. <laughs> John and Patty. Well, it's good to be back. Last month, while you guys were all eating your wonderful food, having a wonderful message, great fellowship, I was having surgery for a knee replacement. So, but it's good to be back and I'm doing well. Mm -hmm. What a day that will be. I jump home. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day. 
sing one now. <coughs> What's this? <laughs> he told us he was. Okay. One more valley. Yeah, I do that with my finger picking. Right? Okay. Do it. I'm putting my box so I forget my pick. Open G or D? One more valley, John. Okay, this is a good song.
You see who's doing the working and who's doing the shirking here. Thank you, Bill. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Always appreciate when John and Patty sing, and I appreciate their choice of music. Our music always has to honor the Lord. Amen. And your music honors the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 16. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. What is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. Under the Jews, I become a Jew. I became, I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law, to Christ that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men that I might by any means save some. And we want to concentrate on that verse there. The last part of that verse I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. We're going to look at the two words there, save some. Father, we ask that you add your blessing to the reading of your word today. And Lord, you know our hearts. We're here on a Tuesday, not just for a meal, but for the fellowship for the singing of your songs and the preaching of your word. And Bible Baptist Church exists for a reason. We're here to save some. And we pray, Lord, that that might be our ministry and we might in each of our lives realize that God has put us here and made us a lighthouse in this city of Byesville and in our neighborhoods that through our witness and through our lives, that we might save some. Help us, Lord, to keep that goal in mind as we look forward to this day. Bless us. Let the Word of God sink in our hearts and cause us to want to be an instrument in your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What are the ministries of Bible Baptist Church? Well, you would say, Bible Baptist Church is here so that we have a place to worship. Our ministry is to worship God. Well, that's part of it. A worship service is part of it. Sunday school. We have the teaching of the Word of God. We have the bus ministry to bring those in that are without transportation and without families that want to bring them in a car. We have our outreach ministries. We have the ministries in uh, Convalescent Home, Miss Kingham uh, Center there for the young people. We have Junior Church. 
We have a wall full of missionaries to take the, mission, the, the word of God around the world. Our senior saints is a ministry of Bible Baptist Church and many, many other that we have. So what are the purposes of these ministries? Everything that we do at Bible Baptist Church needs to have a purpose. Well, our purpose at Bible Baptist Church, you might say, well, our purpose here at Bible Baptist Church is to provide, to provide a place where we can come and worship. We can worship the Lord together. The purpose of Bible Baptist Church is to build the saints. The purpose of Bible Baptist Church is fellowship, the believers. But greater in importance, I believe, the purpose of Bible Baptist Church is a salvation station for reaching the lost. Here, there, and everywhere. The purpose of our ministry at Bible Baptist Church is to save some. Someplace floating around the church are a bunch of my old neckties. I got to the place where single-handed I can't tie a tie. I had a necktie that was given to me by one of my kids years ago, and on it is a picture of Vince Lombardi. And Vince Lombardi makes a statement on that tie. It says, the only place you will find success before work is in the dictionary. And I don't know who got that tie, but God bless you, wear it. <laughs> I miss it. Vince Lombardi was a whale of a football coach. What made him that way? Vince Lombardi was single-minded. He had one thought and one thought only, and that's to win football games. And you worked, and you worked, and you had success. We all know who Pete Rose is. Sorry to say, Pete is probably as well known for his gambling addiction as it was for his baseball. But one thing that we learn about Pete Rose, and we know about Pete Rose, when it comes to baseball, Pete Rose was single-minded. His idea was to win and to win games. John D. Rockefeller, on his deathbed, they asked him, how much more money do you want to make? And his answer, one more dollar. John D. Rockefeller was single-minded. Some of us here, the older members, would remember the ministry of Lester Roloff. Lester Roloff had girls' homes and boys' homes down in Corpus Christi, Texas. And he would take kids that were incorrigible. Parents couldn't do anything. Their communities couldn't do anything. They would take them down to Lester Roloff, and through the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God, those kids would get saved and amount to something for God. Lester Roloff was single-minded. The Apostle Paul was single-minded. We're not apostles like Paul, nor have we his talent or his inspiration. But we have the same Holy Spirit and to the same degree. The Holy Spirit is a person, he can't be divided. We either have him or we don't. We're either saved or we're not. The Apostle Paul had the Holy Spirit dwelling in his body. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling in our bodies. What did Jesus do for Paul that he didn't do for you and I. Well, first of all, Paul was forgiven. Do you remember the day that you were saved? You may not know the time or the date, but do you remember the day when darkness turned to light? 
If you don't remember the day when darkness turned to light, maybe you better check out your salvation. I can remember as a 10-year-old kid, just like it was yesterday, 75 years ago, but I remember it just like it just happened. When God convicted my soul to get up and walk down to an old-fashioned altar and accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, life has never been the same since. Granted, 10 years old, you don't have, a, you don't have time to kill anybody. You don't have time to be an alcoholic. But at 10, you're still a sinner. And when you realize you're a sinner and God gets a hold of your heart, you're just like the Apostle Paul. You're forgiven. Paul was forgiven. He was divinely changed. I know my life changed from that day forward. Not a great sinner, but still the Holy Spirit of God led. The Apostle Paul was redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, just like we're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. He was indwelt by the same Holy Spirit that you and I are indwelt by. Shouldn't there be the same fruit by the same planting? We plant our fields and we expect to harvest. Why was Paul successful? Well, I think one of the reasons Paul was successful was because he was single-minded. He had one great object in life, and that's to magnify his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and to save some. He worked in many ways and was, to many people, the man that came along and told them how they could be saved. And he worked to save some, and so should we. Now, the main object of our ministry here at Bible Baptist Church has got to be to save some. We don't preach to amuse, although a little humor and laughter helps along the way. If I want to see humor, all I got to do is look in the mirror in the morning and I can get a good laugh. Only a face that a mother could love. But we don't preach to abuse people and some people do. I've sat under preachers and I've listened to their sermons and I've laughed and all the way through, but when I got done, there wasn't anything there. It was just one big joke after another. So we don't preach to amuse people. We don't preach to get along with people. If you want to hear sermons that are preached to get along with people, turn on your TV. You get some TV preachers there, and they preach to get along with people and get a good offering out of them. We don't do that here. We preach to pierce the hearts of the unsaved with the truth from the Word of God. If we haven't done that, we haven't done our job. There's a heaven to gain, and there is a hell to shun, and we can't ever lose sight of that. There are a lot of philosophies in the world today. I got my tongue over my eye teeth. I couldn't see what I was saying there. A lot of philosophies in the world today about how the church should operate. And one of the big ones is the church should be on the earth to educate. Should our efforts be to educate? Well, education is valuable. It sure beats ignorance. I think I've told the story before, but I attended a funeral in Kentucky, and it was a primitive Baptist funeral, and the guy that died, 
I don't think ever darkened the door of a church, but they preached him into heaven. And there were about five or six preachers that preached, and ignorance was the, <laughs> was the epitome of the whole service. And this one fellow got up, and he preached a message about the Word of God stretching abroad. The Word of God stretching abroad. The only problem was he couldn't read. So he read stretching abroad and scratching a board. And he scratched a board for 45 minutes. Ignorance. I don't think he made it through the third grade. Missionaries evangelize. Their job is not to educate. The education comes after the evangelization. They're to evangelize and not civilize. Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. God educates after salvation. So our efforts are not to be necessarily, first of all, to educate. Education comes later after salvation. Should our efforts be to moralize? Back when I was in high school, I always showed cattle at the Guernsey County Fair. I'd show sheep, and I showed uh, a steer, maybe different things. We had one of our boys in a VOAG class that had pigs. And I will never forget, his name was Frank Miller, and Frank is going to his reward. But Frank would bring his pig to the fair and he would wash this pig up and polish it and put powder on it, put a ribbon around its neck, and he would show that pig. Well, the fair's over, and the pig goes home. Where does the pig head for? He heads for the mud puddle, and he can't get in the mud quick enough. Now, he's been as clean as he's ever been in his life for these people that come into the fair, but he's still a pig. A Christian becomes moral, even holy after they're saved. You try to be moral before you're saved, you're still a pig and you're gonna head for the pig pen. The Holy Spirit teaches us what we ought to be and gives us the power to be that way. And only the Holy Spirit can do that. What happens, you and I, and our church, if we don't try to save some? Well, it won't be amusing when that trump sounds and hell swallows up our loved ones. I'm very alarmed and very concerned about my family, and I'm sure you're concerned about your family. And I'm glad my kids all serve the Lord. Maybe not the way I would like it, but I'm glad they serve. And I'm glad my, I'm glad my grandkids are following in their footsteps. There are a lot of grandmas and grandpas, their kids are lost and have never heard the gospel because grandma and grandpa didn't teach mom and dad the right way and bring them up right. It's not gonna be amusing when hell opens up and swallows those when that trump sounds. What good is education at the great white throne are you gonna stand before God with your education and say, look at all my certificates, look at all my degrees. And God says, depart from me, you accursed, because you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. What good will morals do in hell? You can be the most moral person in the world and die and lost and go to a devil's hell and your morals aren't gonna do you any good.
Paul had good reason to be single-minded. God is dishonored if we don't strive to win the lost. Our goal has got to be to save some. Only the gospel can change the heart. No other way. I think about the future of an unsafe person. The guy gets paid on Friday, goes to the bar and he drinks up part of his money and he goes home and he buys some groceries and the wife chews him out because he comes home drunk. The kids are grown up in a house like that. He gets older, he gets cirrhosis of the liver and he dies and he goes out into a Christless eternity. But that life that he led here on earth, working from payday to payday, wondering where the next meal is going to come from, and the kids in trouble bailing the kids out, every time they get lost, every time they get in a, have a problem come up, that's the best life that he's going to have. And then to die and go to a devil's hell? The devil's retirement plan is horrible. What about the sum that we see saved? There they're raised. They may not have all the worldly goods that the world has to offer, but they've got joy and they've got peace. And when they get all done, they've got a home in heaven. We can't be rewarded as a good and faithful servant unless we seek to save some. That's got to be the ministry of our church. How do we go about the job of saving some? First of all, we preach the gospel. Not just part of it, not just the part we like, but we preach all of it. We don't preach just about heaven. We don't preach just about the good people. We preach about the good, the bad, the ugly, and we preach about heaven and hell. There's a heaven to gain and there's a hell to shun. They're both as real as real can be. And we preach it all. When you come to it in the Bible, you preach it. When you come to it in the Bible, you teach it. That's the way you do it. The second thing, we've got to bathe it with prayer. Talk to God about a person before you talk to a person about God. The problem we do in our churches today, we offer something to them that doesn't have the Holy Spirit behind it. We see so much green fruit in our churches today people that have gone to church and tried to moralize they've never trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior they've just become a church member and on a church roll maybe even be baptized but they've never trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior that's got to come first and before you can trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior you have to be convicted in your heart that you're a sinner and you need salvation. You can't get saved until you get lost. And I'm sorry to say there are a lot of people in churches today that never got lost. They got saved before they ever got lost and the Holy Spirit never indwelled their heart. We have to preach and bathe it with prayer and let the Holy Spirit do his work. The third thing if we're going to get the job done to save some, we've got to send others to places where we can't go or won't go. Many of us are too old to be called for the mission field today. You say, well, I'm willing to go. Well, at 90, I don't think maybe God can use you in the mission field, but you've got a mission field of your own right in your own neighborhood. Every one of us are a missionary. But it's important that our church has a viable and busy mission program. 
One of the things that concerns this church here is the lack of missionaries that are calling on the phone. You ask the preacher, you used to get phone calls all the time for missionaries. Now they're not calling. Where are the missionaries? We were fortunate enough to be able to take on a couple of missionaries in our last mission conference, but we've lost a couple too that have come back from the field because of health reasons and whatever. But you and I have to be active in a mission program. I'm not going to go to Korea. I'm not going to go to Southeast Asia. I'm not going to even go to the Philippines, and I've got friends in the Philippines. But I can send my dollars. My dollars can go to the Philippines and lead other people to Christ through the missionaries that we send. We have to send others to places where we can't go. And a church without an active mission program of church planning missionaries is not doing the job that God wants them to do. And they're not in the business of saving some. Years ago when my wife was alive, we visited her daughter Cindy and her husband Rob in Tennessee. Her, that was Jane and I's last trip. And we took the back roads on the way back. And we come up through Tennessee into Kentucky and we went through the home of Sergeant Alvin York. How many of you know who Sergeant Alvin York was? One of our first Medal of Honor winners, World War I. Now, I mean, there's not too many here that would remember that. Bill was here, he remembers that. <laughs> Sergeant Alvin York went into the service at 18. His first battle, he didn't come back. And the afternoon was late and it was getting dark. And they looked out of their trenches and here comes a line of German soldiers with their hands up. And behind that line, 15 or 20 German soldiers is Alvin York. He brought back all those prisoners. And they said, where have you been? He says, well, I've been getting prisoners. He says, the woods are full of them. You ought to go get you some. <laughs> Alvin York was a Congressional Medal of Honor winner. You know, we talk about saving some. Sinners aren't hard to find. The woods are full of them. Go out and get you some. Father, we thank you for this church that has, first of all in their ministry, saving some. Not everybody that hears the gospel accepts you as Lord and Savior. We know in our Southeast Asian Orphan Fellowship that they rescue a lot, a lot of orphans. And only about 40% of those, after being rescued and all the things that the Christian people have provided for them, the education, the preaching, the teaching, only about 40% of them accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We know that not everyone that hears the gospel accepts you. But Lord, that doesn't prevent us from preaching and teaching and witnessing and passing out tracts and doing the things we ought to because we know that if we keep at it, there are some that are going to be saved. Help us to never lose sight of the fact that our ministry on this earth, after we're saved, is to reproduce. Help us, Lord, to realize that they're all lost or not hard to find, and help us to keep on preaching and teaching and sending the missionaries so that we might, as a church, save some. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.